All right. So we're talking about purpose this term, and we're talking about um, purposeful prayer is what we started last week. Um, we're going to try to finish that up today. But um, podium has a mind of its own, so it keeps wanting to drop. Um, but we are, um, first we're just going to open up a prayer. Um, yes, I'm sorry. Um, how is this Judy? Judy yeah. is coming along well. She said better than she expected um, at this point. She, therapy's coming in three times a week and working with her and she's doing, she's doing well. Things are coming along. But we do need to continue to remember Judy in prayer. She had her hip surgery um, about a week and a half ago. And so I think it's four to six weeks before they will allow someone to drive after hip surgery because of it probably, you're not allowed to bring your hip in and yeah. pop that artificial mm -hmm. joint out of place. Wow. So with driving, you can. And so there's an other people she's okay as far as people. Yeah, that's what we're going to do now. Okay. Yes. Yes. Yeah. So, um, I'm sorry. I just no, you're fine. Me. So let's remember, Judy, and yes, if you want to, you know, if you feel like you should bless her in some way with taking her food or mm -hmm. going in and straightening up her house or whatever she is. Oh, and that's how she was coming home. She, she was smart for a ride. She went to rehab Friday, and I haven't talked to her since then. She went to smart for about, I guess, it was like what it was. But I thought her son lived at her too. Okay. Um, but when I talked to her earlier in the week, therapy was coming to her home and things were going well. So maybe she just went over there for to stay for a few days. I'll have to follow up and find out. Yeah. So, um, but but she's doing well. She told me better than expected is what her words were. They had her up walking. Uh, Same day. Yeah. And she had surgery. Yeah. Yeah, well. um, Joy Brown, who is Sheila Roberts' daughter, um, had a stint placed Friday in her heart. Um, she was at the gym Thursday and passed out. Um, and they took her and did some tests and she had a blockage, so they put a stint in her heart. Um, so remember her, and she's the one that's kind of in, well, they, she has two daughters and they've both been caring for her, but I know Joy's been the one oh. taking her places and all oh. since Miss Sheila hasn't been doing well. So um, remember them mm. in prayer as well. Mm. So, so Miss Sheila has, is she doing okay? Um, she's, yeah, she's doing better. Okay. She's doing better. It's just you know, taking her a while to get that blood sugar under control yeah. and get her strength back and that kind of stuff. So, um, all right. So, um, Bobby, would you open us in prayer this morning, sir? Heavenly Father, thank you for this day, Lord Jesus. And Lord, for the name you brought up for prayer, that's for the Lord, that your Holy Spirit be good, Lord, talk to them in their time of need, and give them for a pastor cover so they can come back to church. And Lord, just uh, be with them today, and be with them through all that they recovered. And Lord, just bless this lesson today, bless Miss Patty, as she brings forth the word. Yeah. And uh, just anoint her and have the Lord come on her and, and just bless us and put her what she says and uh, just that we can come to our heart and minds and soul that so we can take it in and take it with us as the day goes forward. And thank you for praying. Amen. 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 All right. So, um, as I said, we're talking about purpose and having a life that is purposeful and not just to. You know, it's the Purpose Still Life is a, is a great book and it, it kind of gives us guidance. But sometimes we read things like that and we get, kind of get caught up in catchy phrases and we get caught up in, you know, being more about talking about it than actually living it out. Mm -hmm. And so this is, not, this is not one of those, and I hope we don't ever take anything that God gives us directly as a small group as one of those things, although that's really nice, that's a really good lesson, but I hope we're applying every part of it to our lives and to what we're doing and what we should be doing in our life every day. So purposeful people live purposeful lives in every area of their life. Purposeful people are set apart. So when we, when we talk about living life with purpose, and particularly we're talking right now about purposeful prayer, 
it's talking about how we address prayer all the time, how we look at prayer, what our perspective is on it, and when we do it, it's never just something passive. It's never just something that we do to fill time or out of tradition or out of expectation that, oh, I'm expected to pray, so let me let me spend my 10 minutes. Oh, I've only been here three. Let me pray some more. Oh, I've only been here six minutes. I've got to do it. No, that's not purposeful prayer. That is checking off the boxes. Okay, so when we talk about purposeful prayer, it has meaning. It has a, we have a motive behind why we're doing it that is about furthering us in the kingdom and furthering others in the kingdom, furthering the kingdom of God. So as we think about being set apart, even in our prayer life, who do you pray for? I want you to think about who you pray for. Because a lot of times it's easy to get into a routine. We get into a routine, we have a prayer list, which is great because it helps remind us but instead of fervently praying for the people on our prayer list, we again become mundane in it and we start yes. checking off the names. Lord bless Pastor Phil. Lord bless Kim. Lord bless Ed. And, and it becomes about checking off the names so that we can say, I pray for everybody on my prayer list. Instead of truly, we talk about quality versus quantity. And when we think about that in relation to prayer, quality prayer, it's better to pray 30 seconds intently yes. than to pray 30 minutes passively. Because a passive prayer accomplishes nothing. The Bible tells us, the Word tells us that the effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. So we need to be purposeful in who we pray for and how we pray for them. So last week, toward the end, I mentioned several people. You know, I started talking about people you pray for, people that I would definitely be praying for and do pray for. First of all, first and foremost, we need to be praying for our pastor. And not just, Lord, bless our pastor. But we need to be praying for him for wisdom. We need to be praying for him for sustaining power. To, to continue, to make it, to get through all of the things. We, we have this perceived notion of what being a pastor is. And a lot of people in America, I'll go outside the walls of Freedom Center, and a lot of people in America perceive the role of pastor as working twice a week. <laughs> they preach on Sundays and they preach on Wednesdays and they sit in their chair and spin around in bonbons. I keep tripping over this podium. Mm. Um, bonbons the rest of the week. They haven't met Pastor Phil. They haven't met Pastor Phil <laughs> or any true pastor. <laughs> any true pastor. Because a pastor is a shepherd. Mm. And so when we think about the duties of a shepherd, Shepherds work hard. Yeah. Yeah. They are responsible for every single person in every single sheep in the flock. And not just responsible for making sure they stay in the flock, but maintaining the health of the flock while they're together. Mm -hmm. So so the job of a shepherd is not just showing up on Sundays, preparing a little sermon and getting up there. That is actually the least part mm -hmm. of the duty. It's not a shepherd's part. No, it's not. The, it's not a shepherd's part. the thing about churches today. The, the pastor, the evangelist, the shepherd, instead of being three distinct offices for three distinct people, I mean, they've got it all. Right. Oh, one. So, so when we pray for our pastor, there are so many aspects that we should pray for in their life. 
Mm -hmm. Because their accountability and responsibility mm -hmm. is great. Mm -hmm. Is great. And so it's easy to say, oh, I don't agree with that decision they made. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But we have no idea the 400 factors mm -hmm. that went into that decision. And all of the different opinions mm -hmm. of all the different sheep. Wow. Related to. So the pressure is heavy. Mm -hmm. And the responsibility is heavy. So when we pray, it should be purposeful, not Lord bless Pastor Kelly Teresa. Mm -hmm. Because we look at them and think, oh, they're so blessed they don't need anything. Mm -hmm. But we don't see the tears. Mm -hmm. We don't see the frustration. Mm -hmm. We don't see the pain. We don't see the burden. Mm -hmm. Because they don't show it to the sheep. Mm -hmm. They carry it in private. A lot of times if we ask the Holy Spirit before we pray, mm -hmm. then He will reveal a lot of that to us right. and minute details to pray for. Right. What we need to know. Yes. yes. Mm -hmm. But we we can pray purposefully mm -hmm. for them just knowing their responsibility mm -hmm. in their life. So so that pastor is one. Mm -hmm. But what about, and I mentioned this last week, what about those people? that have your children right now. Oh my goodness. Mm -hmm. They need it. So we we come to church and we send our children to a class. But how often do we purposefully pray for mm -hmm. those people standing before our children, living an example that our children are looking up to, bringing them a word that there's no other adult in there, so we don't really know what word they're bringing. <laughs> How often do we purposefully pray for them mm -hmm. and for wisdom and guidance and leadership and all of those things that they need? Not just, again, Lord bless all of our Sunday school teachers. That's a passive prayer. Mm -hmm. A purposeful prayer pray specifically for each of them by name, for that wisdom, for that guidance. So, do we pray for our government and the leadership of our government? Do we pray or do we just bash them all? Is, are the only words that ever come out of our mouth criticism? and destruction and tearing down instead of lifting up and building up and encouraging and praying for them. Because whether we like the people that are in office now or who are going to get in office or who have been in office, our government is only as strong as they are. Yeah. And they are only as supported <clears throat> as we support them. Mm -hmm. And you say, well, I don't agree with their concepts or ideas or their stance or whatever. Mm -hmm. The Bible doesn't teach us that we have to agree with them. That's right. It says we have to respect their authority. Mm -hmm. yeah. The authority that has been placed over us. And it, the Bible teaches us to pray for those in authority over us. So we don't have to agree to pray for them. In fact, when we disagree is when we should pray for them more because we should pray for wisdom and guidance and for them to hear the Lord's leading to lead us as a nation. So purposeful prayer comes from a purposeful life. And when we are purposeful in our life, we understand that everything that I tear down impacts me. Yeah. Yeah. Everything that I destroy, if, there, if I tear down my church leaders and I spread bad about my church leaders, it impacts me. If I tear down my government leaders and I spread bad about them and I destroy their name and I destroy everything about them, it impacts me. So when we live purposeful lives and we have purposeful prayer, 
It's not lip service. It is not just passing the time. It's a conversation with God about things that matter to us. God teaches us through the Word to pray. And He teaches us how to pray. Not what to pray, but how to pray through the Lord's Prayer. He teaches us how to pray. He also, Jesus gave an example as He prayed. He would set Himself apart in the garden. And He would come back. And He would say, Who's it going that long, guys? Can you even just watch my back while I went and prayed? Are you so complacent that you can't even stay awake while I just go over here and take care of things that are going to matter for you? So, he was trying to teach them that purpose in life shows up everywhere. Or lack of purpose shows up everywhere. So, it's more than just saying, now I'll let you down to sleep. Or, Thank you, Jesus, for this food. Or, God bless this person, this person, this person, this person, and this person. How do you pray for your family? Is it passive? Is it, or is it fervent? The effectual fervent. How do we pray that hedge of protection around them? Is it, Lord, we're children of you, so protect us. Or is it, Lord, build that hedge and camp your angels round about my family. Walk with them every step they take today. And camp your angels around their vehicles as they drive down the highway. Be with them and keep them. Lord, anything that they encounter that would be intended to harm them, I ask you to put a barrier between them and it. I mean, how do we seek God about our family? Or do we just say, Lord, I expect you to do it because... I'm your child and I pay my tithes. So protect my family. And does that actually reach? Yeah. I wouldn't want to take that chance. <laughs> you know, and when you say praying for family, uh, when I pray for my particular, I don't just say the overall thing. I always pray individually and their specific needs because I yes. know and I know what their what they're Limits are of their business and I ain't so, you know, in those areas. And uh, I just go to it. Sometimes I find myself praying longer than I thought I would. That's what that's led by the Spirit. It's right. Like, it's not time limit on further prayer. Absolutely. And, so, and Jane is absolutely right. We pray, we pray that protection, but they each have individual needs. Mm -hmm. For our married children, Lord, bind them together with cords that can't be broken. No. Don't let anything come. No. Don't let anything come between them. Yeah. Help them to know your will for their lives and ministry together yeah. so that they can do what they are called to do for you. Mm -hmm. And Lord, help them to have wisdom as they raise their children. Help them, help them to raise godly children. We can't take for granted that those things are going to happen. Because the enemy comes to steal, kill, and destroy. And so we stand in the gap. I talked last week about being an intercessor. And that is that person that stands between to keep you from, get, from things getting to you and to get to what you need to get to. So they're that stand in the gap person. So when we're interceding for our children, for our grandchildren, for our spouse, for those that we love, that are around us. But a lot of times, we stop there with that fervent prayer. Sometimes we're really consumed and concerned about that, but we're not so concerned, consumed or concerned about the pastor and his thing, yeah. or the, church, the yeah. government leaders. Or, yeah. So purposeful prayer can't be tunnel vision. It can't be focused only on, as I said last week, my four and no more. It has to be 
the needs that we are aware of. Now, can you name every single person and pray for every single need they have every time you get to the down the road? You don't do anything but pray. That's my issue. Okay. So that is where what Jimmy was talking about earlier comes in. When you sit down or kneel down or get on your face before God to do your prayer time, you need to seek God at that time. First, you need to come with thanksgiving and praise and worship and enter into a throne room. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then you let the Holy Spirit lead you into who to pray for and, and that kind of thing in that fervent time. Mm -hmm. The Bible teaches us to pray without ceasing. Yeah. That does not mean you stay there 24-7 and you quit everything else in your life. Because that's not purposeful living. That means as you're driving down the highway, and Penny comes to your mind. You say, Lord, I don't know where Penny is right now or what she's going through, but Lord, you brought her to my mind for a purpose. And I pray right now that you build a hedge around her and you walk with her. And whatever would come against her today, you be with her. Lord, heal her from head to toe. Be with her. Meet her every need physically, spiritually, emotionally. You pray right now. And then you drive on down the road. And then three hours later, your child comes to your mind. And you're like, Lord, be with them. Be with that child. Be with them. Keep them. Move mightily in their lives. And you're going to know something more specific about give them wisdom about that huge decision they're trying to make. But see, that's where purposefully we pray as we live out our day, as we go. We don't have to fall down at work on our bellies and be on the floor prone, prostrate, <laughs> prostrate before the Lord and say, oh God, you brought him to my mind. You must <laughs> no, we can pray without making a scene and it still be fervent. We can pray without making a scene and it still be from the very depths of our heart. But we do it as the Holy Spirit leads and guides us and brings them to our remembrance. I think that um, as I'm processing all the information, it, it's something that I do, but I don't know if other people do, where through the, the way God has taught us to pray is also a way to retrain the way we just think about everything that's happening to us or to other people during the day. Right. So when we see something happen, you know, we know how to pray, you know, the whole circumstantial. Circumstance. Yes. But it's teaching our mind that that dialogue has to just keep on going because what's going to come out if you stop for a minute and thank God and say, give me wisdom now, I need this right now, it's going to change the way that you look yes. at that person or that situation. Absolutely. So, which takes us to what I was going to say next, which is great. It's interesting to read Paul's prayers. When Paul, Paul prayed for the churches. So we have a bird's eye view of his letters to all of the churches that he was writing back when he was writing them. Thanks, sir. When he was writing to them and how his prayers were directed. It's rare, very rare, that Paul prayed for physical needs. Yeah. He prayed that they would avoid spiritual casualties. Paul's focus in praying for the churches was that they would be who God called them to be. And the reason for that is because when we are walking according to God's plan for our lives and trusting Him and knowing that He is sovereign and understanding His sovereignty and that He only allows things that He knows are going to come out for our good if we make the right choices related to them. And that He always provides a way of escape for us when we're in those temptations and circumstances. When we understand all that and we're spiritually sound, the rest is going to take care of itself. Yeah. Does that mean we're never going to be sick? What it means is, when we are, we're going to trust God. Yeah. And when we walk through it, we're going to trust God's 
outcomes. What he determines as the outcome. <clears throat> so it's just interesting to read through and to look at how he prays for the churches. We all are going to die. Yeah. I mean, what's this? Sorry, Ed. I mean, burst your bubble this morning. <laughs> but we are all, from the moment we are born, cells begin to die. Now, some regenerate, some are, you know, we have this process. God made us very uniquely, and we, we regenerate cells and all. But our bodies, because we're living in a fallen world, our bodies are decaying. They are dying. So we're all going to die. But we all have a choice about whether we die spiritually. Yeah, yeah. We don't have a choice of whether we die physically. It's going to happen to all of us. But we have a choice of whether we die spiritually. We can either live eternally with Him or we can die eternally with Satan. We choose that. God does not send people to hell. People choose to go by not God doesn't reject people. People reject God. People reject God and make that choice. So the things that we see Paul praying for is an overwhelming sense of God's presence in their life. A desire for holiness in them. A desire for them to seek after the things of God. A zeal and a love for Jesus. The power of the Holy Spirit active in their lives and them allowing that power of the Holy Spirit. Clear discernment of God's will and plan for their lives. Clearly being able to discern, yes, this is the next step I should take. And it's, I was going to say it's interesting. That's not really the word I want to use. It's ironic how we think we know God's plan and will for our life. Mm -hmm. And then it's not until God allows devastation to come or the world to stop that as we knew it, for us to really realize that our priorities and perspectives were so out of whack. Mm -hmm. So out of whack. So being able to clearly discern, Paul prays for, a safeguard against Satan's influences. We see him praying for them to guard their hearts and minds. We see him praying that they would that they would allow the Holy Spirit to show them, to warn them. Protection for their marriages, for their families, all of the things that keep us Spiritually seen is what we see Paul pray for when he's praying for the churches. And when Paul prays for them, he prays for them with pure motives. It's never about what Paul is going to get out of it. It's always about what God is going to get out of it. It's always about furthering the kingdom of God and what God is going to get from their lives. So, when we think about Philippians, let's read uh, verses chapter 1, Philippians chapter 1, verses 3 through 5. Now, in 1 and 2, he establishes who he's praying for and all that. But in 3 through 5, he says, I thank my God every time I remember you in all my prayers for all of you, I always pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first time, first day until now. So he, he starts off with this thankfulness of who they are, remembering how they have partnered with him and been in unity with him. Being, verse 6 is being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. Then he says, 
it is right for me to feel this way about all of you since I have you in my heart. And whether I am in chains or defending and confirming the gospel, all of you share in God's grace with me. God can testify how I long for all of you with the affection of Christ Jesus. So Paul's establishing, now he's writing this from a Roman prison. He's sitting in a prison cell and he wrote a letter from a thankful heart of his fond memories of the church at Philippi. Paul doesn't say, I thank God every time I think of you. I wish I was there with you instead of in this prison cell. You all don't know what I'm facing over here and I really need your prayers. Mm. No? Mm. That's right. No? Mm. He says, I remember wow. you with joy. Mm. And I am thankful for you. Because you've been with me. He's not saying, yeah, I'm sitting here by myself. Nobody's come to see me. He's thankful for them in unity with his ministry. Then he says in verse 9, And this is my prayer, that your love may abound more and more, more, and more in knowledge and depth of insight, so that you may be able to discern what is best and may be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ, to the glory and praise of God. He says, so this is what I'm praying. I want you to have so much discernment and so much wisdom and knowledge that you know exactly what God wants you to do. And I want your love to just grow and grow and grow. <clears throat> he doesn't ask for prayer. He's praying for them. And he says in verse 12, Now I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that what has happened to me has actually served to advance the gospel. So he's saying, so don't worry about what I'm going through because God's got a plan in all this. Mm -hmm. God knows what he's doing here. It has advanced the gospel. So when was the last time... Oh. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Paula doesn't want me to ask the question. <laughs> when was the last time that you purposefully prayed a prayer of thanksgiving or wrote a letter of thanksgiving telling them how you've prayed for people that have stood with you? For people that have impacted your life as Paul did here. We like to communicate this way. Send. <laughs> because then it's quick, it's convenient, and it can disappear. If I want to take back what I said, delete, delete, delete. That's why people love Snapchat. I don't have a Snapchat account, but apparently Snapchat only stays active for a very short period of time and then it's gone forever. You can't even save the Snapchat. It's a convenient way for people to be ugly and act like it never happened. That's how we like to communicate. But Paul penned a letter. Now, granted, this was a long time ago and they didn't have text messages. <laughs> But when was the last time you wrote a handwritten note or a handwritten letter to somebody that meant something to you? I have, and I've started to get my folders out and bring to show you, but I have every card, picture that my children have ever <laughs> handwritten and made for me. Now my children are 35 and 29. Okay? 
But I have them in a file cabinet in a folder. Mm -hmm. Every Mother's Day card, every... And I go back sometimes and I read some of the notes that they wrote to me when they were five and six. And, and they will say things like, I'll try to be better so I don't get in trouble all the time. <laughs> <laughs> and, I, and I think about what was going through their little heads and what was... How was I teaching them, coaching them, disciplining them, or was I punishing them and it was heavy on, you know, I, want, I, I try to go back and think about what were my actions back then? Are there things that I need to fix from them? But see, if that was in a text and it was gone because I got a new phone and now I lost all my text messages, I would never be able to go back and have those memories or to be able to search myself. Patty, I have some of my parents and grandparents as well. Yes. I mean, it just, I mean, I've made copies to send all the <laughs> kids and all because it just blows your mind. Right. It blows your mind at the things that were said and what mattered. Oh, yes. What matters then versus what matters to us now. Mm -hmm. You know, and I've talked to people who have gone through some difficult times and very, at various times in their life, and I've heard people say things to me like, man, I thought I was on track and I was doing all of these things, and I realized I spent all these years making this happen, thinking this was our goal and our dream, to realize God was never in that. That God never intended for us to be so consumed with that that we forgot about our friends and family that we never got to spend time with because we were so busy with that. Mm -hmm. I, that we forgot about raising our teenager and now they're an adult and they're making bad choices that we were never there. We were there in snippets of time but there was no quality to what we were doing because we were always searching after this. So when Paul prays for them to discern what God would have them do. That is so much more appropriate than saying, God, bless that endeavor there now. Because that endeavor may not be God's will. So Paul was praying for the things that matter for these churches. Can you give us um, This pandemic, you know, I've felt it for so much that God is, you know, you take something bad and good comes out of it. And, right. And for us to be home with our families and spend the right time that they need and do it purposefully, like I said, purposefully. And, you know, for me, I, I think for one thing, he's trying to get those that don't know him to turn to him. And for me, who does know him, to seek him in, in a deeper way. Right. Mm -hmm. Because we've gotten so to be such surface Christians. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And surface I, I would challenge you to think about who is your best friend? Physically. Who is your, who's the person that is your best friend? And then what qualities in them make them that best friend? And do you reciprocate that? Because we take people for granted when we get busy. We take everything for granted when we get busy. We don't think about our bodies and taking care of them. When we're so busy, we think about our appointments. We think about our duties. We think about where I need to be next and what time I need to be there and what time I have to get up to do it. We don't think about taking care of the temple of the Holy Spirit that God has given us individually. So, so I hope that as we go through this 13-week study on purpose, that it's not just, a, oh yeah, we need to be purposeful people, that's a really catchy phrase. I want it to dig deep inside of me. And I want everything that you do, I want you to actually Come to the place where you stop and think, of, what's the purpose of this activity? What's the purpose of this activity? And does it build up, 
encourage, do something to help someone so that they can be better for God. Because that's what purpose in life really is. We don't we don't practice gratefulness and thanksgiving. We celebrate it once a year. But we don't practice gratefulness. And it's, it's become more difficult to practice gratefulness and thanksgiving because we have taken on the characteristic of an entitled society. Mm -hmm. So even though we look at people and think, oh, why are you so entitled? Why do you think that we owe you this? Why do you think that the world owes you this? Why do you think that God owes you this? We seldom look in that mirror and say, why do you think God owes you that? Why do you think your, your employer owes you that? Why do you think the government owes you that? Because we become so accustomed to and settled into the character and culture of the world, we don't even realize it's rubbed off. Mm -hmm. That it's rubbed off on us. And so we come and somebody doesn't speak to us or makes us mad, we don't realize that it's entitlement mm -hmm. to presume that they should. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's entitlement. That I'm presuming that you should speak to me every time you come, Papa. I'm your teacher. Yeah. You should speak yeah. to me. That's entitlement. That's expecting something of someone that they may have no clear understanding that that's an expectation. And then I get offended because I take offense to that. Mm -hmm. So we become so entitled and we don't even know. We don't even know. So we have to practice gratefulness until it becomes a part of our DNA. Every time we want to grumble and complain, if we would stop ourselves and say, you know what, I'm thankful for it. I've mentored husbands and wives that were at odds. <laughs> I've mentored couples, I've mentored the wife of a couple who they were at odds with their husband and they would come and tell me all the horrible things that their husband does and what a horrible husband they are trying to get permission to leave him from their mentors. <laughs> and I would say, haven't heard anything biblical in there that gives you the right to walk away. So, we need to work on what you can fix. And they're excited. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Until I say, the only thing you can fix is you. So let's work on the things that are in you that might be causing some of this behavior. They really don't want to hear that. No. Causing some of this behavior or adding to some of this behavior. Mm -hmm. Or maybe you're just perceiving it differently than it really is. Mm -hmm. So let's work on those things. And so I will tell them, when you met them, Oh, they could do no wrong. I want you to go back to those days <laughs> in your mind. And that thing that has, when they take the candy wrapper off and they throw it back in the candy bowl instead of putting it in the trash, they just drive you nuts. And that is, they're just nasty, lazy people because they do that. I want you to be thankful that they're able to to use their hands and take the wrapper off and put it back in the room. Because if you find something to be grateful for in the situation, you'll be less apt to find critical things. And I said to them, and if you can't find anything else, just say, I like your shoes. Just find something to compliment them on every day. So I had one, this went on for a while. She told me, she said, I'm trying. And I didn't have anything the other day, and I looked down, and I was going to compliment his shoes, and he was barefoot. <laughs> I said, so what did you find to compliment him on? Why well, didn't have anything? I said, because you're not looking. 
You were following what I told you to do, and you aren't doing it purposefully. You aren't looking. You have to look for something to be thankful for. And you have to practice that. You have to practice it all the time until it becomes a part of your DNA. Because grumbling will become a part of your DNA really, really quick. Grumbling, and it's hard to get rid of. It's hard to get rid of when you say, why do we have to wear these masks? I hate them too. Okay? You just said that conversation. I hate them too. But we have to respect the authority that's been placed over us. So if the sign is on the door, face coverings required, yeah. put it on and walk in the door. Because that is submitting to the authority that God has placed over you. That does not mean that you agree with everything they've done and said. It means that you are doing what God commanded you to do as a child of God. If they say recommended, make your choice. You have the right to choose when it says recommended. It's up to you. Don't go in there saying, ah, see, they don't think they should wear them either. See? Oh, look at them. They're like they're going to protect something. They got it pulled down over their nose. Off of their nose. They're not even. Um, that's a critical yes. spirit. Yes. Yes, that is. is a critical spirit. So we need to have thankfulness of heart and obedience. And it's a constant of reevaluating. We need to yourself. It is. Because we, it's easy to fall right back. Easy we're so easy to say. Mm -hmm. And not. We don't think about all of these that are coming right back when I'm. You know, when somebody's pointing, I'm like, is that thing loaded? Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, everybody has character defects. We all do. And so we have to learn to understand that God commanded us to be set apart. God commanded us to be different. And that doesn't mean that we're rebellious and go against everything that is wrong. It means that we represent Him. We represent Him and we do, you know, they ruin what would Jesus do with the bracelets and the mail, catchy little quick funny phrase. And it became, but in reality, if we would just live life that way, we would be doing what the Word tells us to do. If we would just do what Jesus would do. What would he do in this situation? Would he call them that ugly name or would he embrace them? Would he look at their differences and say, you're not worthy of my attention? Or would he say, you're exactly the reason I'm here because it's just like people like you that I came so you could be saved. See, our perspective is so opposite of what Jesus' perspective is his perspective is, I want every one of you to come to repentance. Mm -hmm. I want all of you to be saved. You're all worthy of the blood I shed because I freely gave it so that you could have it. And we're like, oh, they murdered a child. They don't deserve God. They deserve to hang. They deserve to be put under the jail. See, we cast judgment and Jesus is hanging between two thieves. thieves. Mm -hmm. And one has an unrepentant heart, mm -hmm. but the other one is like, oh man, you help me. And he's like, today you're going to be with me. Mm -hmm. Today you're going to be with me. Mm -hmm. Now, in the world's eyes, they deserve to be on that cross, <clears throat> being hanged in a disrespecting manner. But in Jesus' eyes, he's like, I'm taking your spirit with me today because of your repentant heart. Mm -hmm. So when we live purposeful lives, we purposefully look for the thing in them that Jesus died for. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> if they were perfect, like we think we are, <laughs> Jesus wouldn't have had to die. So we have to look from a perspective through the eyes of Jesus, of what He looks at. 
So ungratefulness will never attract a lost world. Joining in with their disrespect and ungratefulness will never attract them because you're just like them. Yeah. You're just like them. Jesus stood out everywhere he went, every city he traveled to, everything he did, he stood out because he was different, set apart. He didn't act ugly like everybody else acted ugly that got arrested. He didn't resist arrest and demand his rights and demand his attorney and demand this and demand that. He didn't do those things. He went willingly without opening his mouth. Without opening his mouth. Because he knew if they were going to prosecute him, they were going to do it on their fabricated information, not on his life. He didn't have to defend his life. He knew that his life was pure and holy. So when we are being thankful and grateful, even in the terrible times, even in the bad circumstances, even when things don't go the way we think they should go, even when people disappoint us, even when people act crazy and stupid, and you think, wow, just why did they have to do that? Even in those times, if we can stop and say a prayer of thankfulness, God, I'm so thankful that I have them in my life. And I'm so thankful, Lord, that this is one more opportunity where I will be led by you and hear your voice for wisdom to impart wisdom to them and how they can grow from this. And have that heart of thankfulness and that prayerful thankfulness rather than ungratefulness and complaining. <clears throat> Patty, how would, how would someone explain necessarily to another person who or would you even bother how you have to go through the process that God has set forth for you and you have to do that with gracefulness and thankfulness but that also means that sometimes you don't have to be outwardly bold about the situation how would you explain that to someone so, without them thinking that you're being passive or weak right. So you have to wait for God's timing because God has to prepare them to receive it. If you, it's just like going to an addict where when they're still in the process and denying that they even have a problem and say, I'm just, it doesn't have a problem. You have a problem and you need help. You need rehab. They're not going to receive it because they're in a state of mind of, I don't have a problem. I don't have a problem. So we have to wait for God to open that door. So we pray for God to prepare the road ahead of us, prepare their hearts ahead of us, and to give us wisdom to know when to speak and when to shut up. Because we might be planting a seed at a time. But we teach more how we do it than how we say it. So we have to live that consistent example and we can't grab and complain about the pastor mm -hmm. while we're saying you don't have to lash out about everything in the government you don't like mm -hmm. because we're saying do as I say, not as I do. Mm -hmm. So we have to live consistency in our life and show them that there is a better way and it's more peaceful and we can trust God but then God will open that opportunity and they might say, well, why didn't you get mad about that? Why didn't you pitch a fit about that? Why didn't you show out? And then you say, because look how it turned out with me just trusting God and me taking it to God instead of taking it out and being ugly and showing myself and becoming a, a, a spectacle to the public. So we, it, it's, a, it's a big... It's all. It's not just one little answer. We have to consistently live it, and then when we have opportunity, we have to be instant in season and out of season to give reason for our hope, to give reason for doing that. So as we're living it, then they ask, "Well, why didn't you act? Why didn't you do this? Why didn't you tell them?" 
And I guess when you're being obedient to that, you have to put aside what other people might think. Absolutely. You made in the property. Absolutely. Absolutely. That's just like they always ask me at the store, you know, how do you stand these customers and not want to go <laughs> Okay, first of all, I'm living for God and he ain't having it. Yes. But the bottom line, y'all, y'all win because they can't walk out the door with, with what they say they want. Right. Because we're not giving it. And y'all win. So why do y'all get upset? Mm -hmm. So Yeah. You know, it it costs you more to be ugly than it does to be nice. Because your heart rate goes up. Your blood pressure goes up, your stress level goes up, you weaken the muscle of your heart, you set yourself up and make yourself more prone to strokes, to diabetes, to high blood pressure, to a heart attack, because you react instead of responding. But they be mad all day. Oh, okay. after that happened, they be yeah. mad all day. Yeah. And they're not doing Everybody else. come in the building. I'll be like, I'll be like. Sometimes it carries over to the next day and the next well, yeah. year, the next week, the next, the next <laughs> century. We we carry it. And God says, let not the sun go down on your body. Let not the sun go down. We're not supposed to carry it to the next day. We're supposed to resolve it. And if, even if we can't resolve it with the person, we have to resolve it in ourselves and with God. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. And be at peace when we lay our head down at night. Yeah. And not carry it <clears throat> over and over. But we pay more for being ugly than we pay for being nice. Mm -hmm. So we have to understand that our answers don't come from the election. <laughs> it does not matter who wins on November 3rd if we even know who wins on November 3rd. It doesn't matter related to whether there's going to be answers or not. Mm -hmm. Because they don't come from the election. Mm -hmm. They come from God Almighty. Mm -hmm. And God's here now. Mm -hmm. We don't have to wait till November 3rd to hear God's voice. Mm -hmm. We don't have to wait till November 3rd to hear what He has a plan for us for the coming months. We can trust Him. So we can't change the course or the stem of decline or the cynicism by going out and trying to fix the world. All we can do is change what's in us and then allow God to use that to be an example for others. That may or may not change them because they have the choice. They have the choice of whether they're going to allow it to change them or not because God gave us that. He gave us all that choice. But whether they receive you or don't, whether they change or don't, whether the world is still rioting in the streets on November 4th, or whether we have socialism on November 4th, it, it, it should not change who you are in Christ or who you are in your life that is living purposefully for Him. Do we put up signs? I mean, like we have Trump pants on our car and we have the American flag in our yard, but is that like fomenting? It's, I mean, it feels like we're fomenting because people... So, I, you know, I'm not going to give an opinion one way or the other okay. on that because that's, a, again, choice. That's freedom of speech. That's yeah. choice. You have a constitutional right to do that. Right. What I'm saying, if God's making you question that, yeah. I yeah. would seek Him about. Okay. okay. I would okay. seek Him about. Because it may be fine except for you because God may be trying to grow something in you that says, you know, you've had this issue maybe with, and I don't know. I'm no, just, no, go you ahead. Go ahead. You've had this issue with maybe causing some division, yes. kind of speaking yes. out too much before, yes. and this is just something I'm trying to grow in you, so I just think you should take it down and pray and let me handle the election. You know, God does those things. He deals with us individually about things and mm -hmm. convicts us about things that aren't necessarily yeah. wrong. Yes, exactly. But we, they're wrong for us if God tells us they're wrong. He said he's the one who puts them in. He puts them in and takes them out. Yeah, we should go vote. Oh, yeah. We should exercise our right to vote. And we should do those things. We should be a part of the, the government we're part of, the process. 
But we should not put all of our stock lock and barrel in who gets in and who gets out because God's still on the throne. That's right. He is still in charge regardless. And if the sooner we learn that, the more peace we're going to have inside of us. We cannot change everything in the world. But we can change everything in us. Alright, we have gone way over. We got help.